Family, here we are again. Let's gather wherever you are with your spouse, your children, uh, by yourself, your roommate, wherever you are, and let's fulfill what the Word says. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. We've got a few members of our team here to help us worship, but I pray that all of us online right now will worship Him together. Bless you. Good morning, Grace Covenant Church. Welcome to Grace Online. I'm Shannon. And this is Ruben. I'm Joel. I'm Jess. Grace Covenant Church is a people with a heart for God and God's heart for people. Join us as we worship the King and praise Him in spirit and in truth.
We worship a God who has no rival, no equal. I'm so glad. In this moment, I want to encourage you from Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, and this is the New Living Translation. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. Why? For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. I'm so encouraged that though we run into all kinds of trials and difficult situations, here's what we know. We know that it is producing strength of character. And I'm grateful for the strength of character that is being produced in you, produced in me. Uh, Though the challenges are unwanted, the character is much needed. So God, we're grateful for that. And here's what is so encouraging. We know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. One translation says that uh, the love of God is shed abroad by the Holy Spirit. So that even though we are joining one another virtually, the truth is we are connected because God's love is, is being expressed and experienced by all of us through his Holy Spirit. So you at home, you at this place, you at that place, yet we are all together, brought together by the Holy Spirit and by that same love we share. Amen. Worship team again, thank you so much. In this moment, I want to encourage us as we give to God uh, for our tithes and our offering. And if you are giving online, uh, please feel free to use the PushPay app, which is available to you. If you are writing a check, make it payable to GCC. You don't have to write out Grace Covenant Church. You can if you want. But mail it to our church facility located at 3118th Street Northeast in Washington, D.C. And uh, we're grateful. But here's the encouragement. In Acts chapter 10, uh, verses one through six. I may not read it all, but that's the reference. And this again is New Living Translation. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel asked, Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He's staying with Simon a Tanner who lives near the seashore. So I read more than you may need to know in this moment. Here's the thought. The gospel is spreading beyond one community of people to the rest of the world. And Cornelius, who is a non-Jew, this is a man who, when he has this supernatural encounter, how encouraged must he be to hear this? Your praying and giving has ascended to God as this wonderful aroma offering. As a result, I want you to send for Simon, the one we call Simon Peter, because he has a message for you. And that led to the spreading of the gospel beyond the Jews to non-Jews. I want you to know something. May it be said of us that our praying and giving is not just praying and giving, but that it actually is that which ascends to God as this wonderful aroma, so much so that it captures God's attention. And he calls us by name. When the angel appears, he says, Cornelius, he knows him by name. May it be that we are known by name, that when God shows up, he says, Grace Covenant, you're praying and giving, or you by your own name as well, your praying and giving has ascended to God as a memorial offering. And as a result, may that praying and giving not only capture the attention of God, but may it result in the gospel spreading beyond us to communities that have yet to hear of his love. Amen. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are, whenever you are. We're so glad that you could join us from whatever device you're watching this on. 
My name is Rich. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Covenant Church, and it's an honor and a privilege to be able to share God's word with you this morning. My hope today is to encourage you with uh, wherever you are in life and whatever situation you're in, uh, my hope is that you leave here encouraged and inspired. Uh, The title of this message this morning is called Sanding, Sanding, How God Shapes Us. You know, I've been thinking a lot about how the mandatory shelter in place has been impacting people and families. And I've heard, I've heard so many good things about things like families are closer than ever, or they're cooking more than ever. But I've also heard some challenging things like families are closer than ever, and you're cooking more than ever. And it's just funny how some things could be challenging, but be a good thing at the same time. And um, for those of you who don't live alone, you probably find yourself rubbing closer against uh, people. You know, you're closer to people than you normally used to. And You might hear the phrase, man, they're rubbing me the wrong way in tight quarters or whatever it may be, a lot like sandpaper. And if you don't have a roommate, if you're not living with anybody, uh, I'm sure there are things that are rubbing you the wrong way in this season as well. And so in the same way, there's there's still some sort of sandpaper, some some aggravation going on there. But I want to encourage you. um, So why the picture of sanding? Let me tell you why. For the past five months, my family has been displaced from our home due to a leak in our kitchen, a small pinhole leak. And we've been in hotels, we've been in Airbnbs, and we're actually hoping to move back in this weekend, Lord willing. But because the house has been empty during the week and in the evenings and on the weekends, I really wanted to take the opportunity to try to get some projects done around the house. And one of them is taking the carpet off of our stairs and and replacing it with some stair treads. And so I decided in the past couple months to become a carpenter. Thank you, YouTube, for helping me become a carpenter in just one day. And so I've been working on wood, and I'm not a woodworker, uh, but I've been learning a lot of things uh, during this past season. And, and truth be told, I feel closer to Jesus when I'm working with the wood. Maybe it's because he was a carpenter and I'm a carpenter now. I don't know. But either way, I feel closer to God, but he's really been showing me a lot of things, everything from from having the idea in your head of what you're trying to do to measuring and to cutting and to, to sanding and then painting and then sanding again or adding polyurethane, two coats, and then watching it dry and being patient. And God's been revealing a lot of things to me. And it's one thing I realized is that my wife and I, we used to watch a lot of DIY shows, uh, DIY channel and stuff like that. And it's, it's funny, I go back and watch them now and I'm like, man, they are editing out and cutting out all the hard work. They're cutting out so many steps because in 30 minutes, they want, to, they want you to see a broken down home get fully renovated and look amazing. And I think so many times we look at people's lives and we look at people's lives in the, in the Bible and stories and we see a finished product or a product that's close to being finished. And we feel a certain way because we're nowhere close to that. Not realizing that there is a process that God applies to our lives to help us and shape us into what he wants us to become. So I want to share a few things with you. Now, real quick, sandpaper. If you don't know what sandpaper is, good for you, but sandpaper is basically a sheet of paper that has these things on it called grit, uh, grits. And they're little things that, uh, the little dots, if you will, that allow you that when you rub it onto a surface, it either smooths out a surface or removes layers of, of paint or rust or whatever it is you're trying to sand. And the grit is measured by a square inch. So if you say I have a 60 grit, that means there's 60 dots within a square inch of that sandpaper. And so the higher the grit, the finer the sand. So 60 grit would be considered coarse and 120 grit would be considered uh, medium or, or, and then 220 would be fine. And 100,000 grit would be super fine. And let me tell you, God uses people and things as sandpaper to shape us. I'm going to say that again. God uses people and things and events, circumstances. God uses all kinds of things in our lives as sandpaper to shape us and to refine us. For instance, my beautiful wife, she's fine grit. She's fine grit. (laughs) She's that fine grit. Any any husbands watching this right now that you could agree with me, your, your wife is fine grit. Don't say that too loud. But early in marriage, I was rough. I was very abrasive. I was the, that piece of wood that just needed a lot of help. And, and God has used my wife over the years to work out um, some deep imperfections in my soul. 
some deep imperfections in my attitude and in my character. And I had, and I still have a lot of them. But God has used my wife and my children and so many things to sand me down, to refine me, to shape me. As I'm working with the wood in my house, I find that I often make a lot of mistakes with chipping the wood or cutting it the wrong way. But adding some sandpaper can fix so many things because the wood is pliable to it. Just the other day, I heard my wife reasoning with my, and correcting my four-year-old daughter. And I was kind of sitting in the living room while I heard her correcting her, applying sandpaper to our daughter, if you will. And I was like, yeah, Jamila, you get her. Yeah, you tell her, (laughs) you help her, you shape her. And then halfway through the correction, I realized, I was like, man, that sounds familiar. I think I've heard that before. As in just the other day, I heard that. My wife is using the same correction on my daughter that she was using with me. It's still not determined whether or not she was talking to me like a four-year-old or she was talking to her, to my daughter like an adult. But either way, God is using my wife to sand our family, to refine us and shape us. And so we often hear the phrase, rubbing the wrong way. But that also implies that there is a right way to rub. And so I want to talk about that. And I do think that there's a right way that God wants to use sandpaper to rub us in our lives. So I got three quick points for you. And then I want to finish with a story, bring kind of all these together. The first one is the preparation of sand. And before we do that, I just want to pray real quick. God, we thank you. God, we thank you that you didn't just make us, but you also shape us. God, thank you for not just making us and then letting us become whatever we become, but you are actively involved with shaping us, and you use everything at your disposal to accomplish your will. So, Father, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the first one is the preparation of sanding. Sanding prepares you for what God has prepared for you. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. God has prepared us to do good works. And as a master craftsman, all of his works are good. And I love the fact that he's preparing something. You are not an accident. We are not an accident. That, that even if your parents plan to have you or not, God prepared something for you. He had you in mind when you were created to do something great. And he is preparing us for what he has prepared for us to do. And my father-in-law, he's a, he's a master painter. He's painted houses and rooms, and for, he's done it for a living in seasons of his life. And over the years, I've actually picked his brain, uh, trying to get tips on how I could be a better painter, uh, painting the rooms and stuff in my house. And a couple of things that he taught me. One thing was this, is that no matter how good of a painter you are, no matter how good your paint is, no matter how good your tools are, If you don't prepare the walls that you're going to paint, when you're done painting, all those cracks and those blemishes and those holes and and the imperfections are going to stick through. And you're going to see those more than you're going to see a nicely painted wall or a nicely painted house. Um, One tip, uh, he he said this too. He said, if you to fix a hole, for instance, right? He was telling me about how do you fix a hole? And I was like, yeah, you just put some putty over it and, and sand it down. He's like, that's almost right. But if you just try to cover a hole with putty, uh, the spackle, he said, when you paint over, you sand and you paint over it, that's fine. But down the road, if any pressure is applied to that hole or to that point, it's very possible that it can kind of break through because there's nothing sustaining it behind the hole. And so what he was recommending was is that you get some newspaper and you just crumple up the newspaper and you just shove it in there as much as you possibly can so that there's something pushing up against the spackle. So that when pressure comes later on, it's not hollow and it won't break through. And then you sand it and you paint it. And you guys know how preaching works. You know I'm not just talking about painting and talking about a hole in a wall. The truth of the matter is you can't just slap paint over uh, your issues, pain, hurt, sin, and say, look, God has, God has made me brand new. Because whenever you cover a hole instead of filling it, when pressure comes, that hole's revealed. Those imperfections are still revealed. But God can make you new. But a great comforter prepares the materials before using. So sanding prepares you for what God has prepared for you. The second point, 
So we got the, the preparation of sanding. Now is the pain of sanding. This is going to be the shortest point, and I'm trying to sandwich this in the middle of the message on purpose because it's the one that we probably don't like to hear the most. But it's the fact is that when, when sanding happens in our lives, it's, it can be very painful. It does, it's not meant to feel good. Um, sanding doesn't feel good, but it produces something good. In Romans chapter 5, verses 2 through 5, it says this, Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I don't know about you, but because I know what's coming next, I'm inclined to stop there and say, oh, yeah, that sounds great. That sounds real good. Uh, I want to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. I want to stand by faith into the grace that he gives us. But it goes on to say this. It says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. He says, we rejoice in our sufferings. I'm glad that when he wrote that, he wrote that in faith, saying that we rejoice. I'm like, do we? Do we rejoice? Because I don't always rejoice in those moments. But thank you for Paul for thinking about me in that way. But he says this. He says, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Suffering is a state of undergoing pain, distress, or hardship. How do you rejoice in suffering? So many of you are suffering in different ways. Financially, emotionally, spiritually, physically. We are suffering in so many different ways. How do we rejoice in that? But he says, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. See, when you know what the pain and the suffering is going to produce, then, you, can, then you, you know that you can withstand something not feeling good because it's going to produce something good. And the pain isn't just what you feel during the sanding, but sometimes the pain is on how long it, the sanding takes. It's not knowing when, when is the sanding going to stop. You know, God, I can endure some suffering and some pain, but, but if I knew that was only going to be for an hour or for a day or for a week, at least I can get that, that frame, that reference in my mind of how long it's going to be. But what about when you don't know how long the suffering is going to be? That in of itself can be just as painful as the suffering. But I want to encourage you, God is producing something good. Because sanity doesn't feel good, but what it produces is really good. The third point is the purpose of sanding. It's my favorite one. See, sanding isn't the end. It's the means to an end. The goal in our Christian walk, our walk with Christ, our pursuit of God, our goal is not to look for ways to be sanded. God, please correct me. God, please hurt me. God, I want to suffer. And, and, and it's one thing to, have a, to be okay with suffering for God, but the suffering that, that God allows to happen in our lives is not the goal of being a believer. The goal is that it, it, it produces something in us that it would not have been able to have been produced otherwise. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, it says this. We all, with unveiled faces, are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So, so what is Paul saying here to the church of Corinth? He's saying, we don't have veiled faces. And by the way, if you go back and read before this, it's talking about Moses and how he wore a veil because he didn't want us, the people to see the glory of God fading from his face. But for us, we have unveiled faces and we're looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed. I love this. See, God is shaping us. God is transforming us. He's the preparation of the sanding, the pain of the sanding, for the purpose of the sanding. And the purpose of the sanding is this, is that we are shaped to look like him. So that when we look at him and he looks at us, the goal is this. It's like looking into a mirror. When you look into a mirror, do you see the face of God? And the, if the answer is no, which it probably is for all of us until Jesus comes back, but is this, is there's some more sanding that needs to happen. There's some more refining that needs to happen. And that shouldn't discourage you. Whether you've been walking with God for two days 
or two decades, there is always something that God wants to refine, to shape in us, because the purpose is ultimately to look like a mirror. I saw this video uh, online, uh, literally just this, within this past seven days, and and this is I already knew I was preaching on this subject, and it didn't hit me to the end of the video, but there's this video where this guy took an older iPhone, old metallic iPhone, and he taped the top and the bottom on the backside, and then he squirted a little bit of water on there, and then he began to rub it with some sandpaper. He actually started with some fine sandpaper. And uh, it was like a 10-minute long video, which I feel like it was a two- or three-hour process because they sped it up really fast. He must have went through 12 different levels of grit, 12 different kinds of sandpaper, starting with 120, working his way all the way up to 100,000 grit per square inch. And every time he was sanded it and then squirted it with water, rub it off. Sand it again, squirt it with water. Sand, sand. And it was a long process. Even though it was sped up, you still could see that it was laborious. And the end goal was this, is he took a regular piece of just kind of like, you know, metal on the back of an iPhone. By the time he was done, it was, crystal, it was a crystal clear mirror. Up until that point, I knew sanding could happen on wood, and that's what I was going to focus on. But when I saw that, this scripture immediately jumped up to me because God shapes us, but the sandpaper in life is actually making us look more like him. Why? Because the finer the grit, the longer you let God stand you, the more you walk with him and you're refined, you actually truly can look like a mirror in the same way that the iPhone, he showed it to the camera, he put it on the floor. It was like, it was literally a mirror. I don't know why anyone want to do that on the back of their iPhone, but I think it helped me with bringing this point home. But we are God's workmanship. And when we let him sand us, the end result is that we look like him. My hope is that at the end of this season, no matter what you're suffering, in all your sufferings, that you would look more like him and less like you used to look like. When Joseph, um, I'm going to talk about Joseph here in a minute, but I love this, is that if God's purpose of sanding is for us to look like him, I realize that his purpose has never changed. That was his blueprint even from the beginning. In Genesis 1.26, it says, Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. It was always God's intent for us to look like him. And I believe when he made Adam and Eve and put them in the garden, they looked like him. But when sin entered the world, it began to scuff us up, to bruise us, to hurt us, to cause imperfections and wounds, holes, cracks, all kinds of things. But God, because he is a master architect, he is a creator, he is a shaper, he is a carpenter, he is a builder, he has not given up on us. He has not given up on you. He wants to refine you by sanding you. If only you knew what God was making you into. So sanding isn't the end. It's the means to an end. So hopefully with these thoughts, it'll help you be encouraged that when you feel life sanding you, when you feel people sanding you, you recognize that ultimately it's God doing this. God is shaping you. All these things may not come from God, but God will use anything to shape us to look like him. I want to close with this, sharing a story about Joseph. And really the story kind of spans over Genesis chapters 37 through 45, and I'm going to kind of touch here. So I would encourage you to go back this week and maybe read, read through those chapters with your family. Uh, read through it with your friends online. Read the story. But it's a great story where you can see the preparation, the pain, and the purpose of sanding in this man's life and how it impacts him and, tr and really everyone around him. You know, oftentimes we read the story and we're, there's two pits that are referred to. The first pit is the one that his, his brothers threw him into in the beginning of the story. Basically, his brothers were jealous of him and, and uh, Joseph did a couple of things that he probably shouldn't have said or maybe communicated some things too premature or prematurely rather. But because of the jealousy, they threw him into a pit. In fact, it was actually a cistern. It was a, not a well, but it was a, it was a thing that collected rain water. But it was empty at the time. And so they threw him into that. So the first pit was a cistern. And then they had compassion on him. They said, man, you know, that's our brother, man, because they were plotting to kill him. But then somebody was like, we can't kill him. He's our brother. Let's just sell him into slavery. <laughs> and so they, they pull him out, and then they sell him into slavery. And he's eventually purchased in Egypt by a man named Potiphar. And, and there's favor in Joseph's life where he rises in the ranks. And long story short, he begins to run Potiphar's home. He runs his house. 
But then Potiphar's, Potiphar's wife tried to make a move on Joseph, and he was like, no, 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 I'm not having any of that. And he rejected her. He did the right thing, but as a result, she accused him of assaulting her. And so he was thrown into another pit, if you will, a jail cell this time. And, he, and by the way, this whole story spans over 20 years. Remember I said earlier, we could, you could read it in an hour or watch a movie an hour and a half, but this was 20 years of God sanding this man, and we're seeing the highlights. And he's in this second pit. He's in this jail cell. The first pit, he's alone. God's sanding him. The second pit, he's in a jail with others, and God is still sanding him. And he finds favor with the, with the, with the jail, with the guys running the jail. In fact, he starts running the jail. You know, and I've heard people say this before. It's like, man, you know, I, I want to have that kind of favor that Joseph had when he was in jail. I'm like, yeah, but don't forget, he was in jail. You know, it's like he was going through some hard times. But yeah, but the favor of the Lord was upon him, and that is true. But you know, God's favor can be on you, but that doesn't exempt you from going through hard times. That doesn't exempt you from suffering and feeling that sandpaper working on your soul and working on your heart. But it's true. He found favor. And in fact, in, in fast forwarding through the story, skipping over a bunch of parts, he eventually has an opportunity to go from the jail to talk to Pharaoh, to interpret some dreams. And in this interpretation, he not just only interpreted the dream, but he told Pharaoh the solution to the issue that the dream was presenting. He said, there's going to be seven years of, of plenty and then seven years of famine. And then he said, but here's the interpretation on how we are going to survive during this season of lack. And he begins to unfold the plan. And it was, there was so much wisdom and grace and favor on Joseph in that moment. Because remember, God had been shaping him for the last 10, 15 years up until this point. So he was a different man. He was, there was something about him that was unique and different. So much so that Pharaoh said, you are now second in command over all of Egypt. And then we fast forward a few, a few years later during the times of famine. Joseph's brothers show up at his doorstep asking to buy food from him. And they says that they didn't recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognized them. And not only because Joseph was, I think, dressed like an Egyptian and probably looked different just aesthetically, but I also know that the Joseph that they knew when they threw him into the cistern and sold him into slavery wasn't the same Joseph that they were coming across decades later. And then after some interactions, he knew it was them, but he had some heart issues in the moment. He was a little concerned. He kind of lost his composure a little bit. And long story short, he sent them away but kept one of the brothers there. He found out he had another little brother. It's a really great story. A lot of drama in here. They should make an animated movie about it. Um, but then the brothers eventually come back. And Joseph, I, I, can just, I can't imagine what Joseph is struggling with and dealing with and how to process this. This is a man who's been in a pit. He's been in jail. He's been wrongly accused his whole life in so many different ways. And yet he's found himself successful. I mean, as high as he could possibly be in his culture, in his country, he's, he's achieved the pinnacle of success. But I believe there's a third pit that he's always been in that he hasn't yet got out of yet. And it's the dysfunctional relationship that he had with his brothers, with his family. And so I pick up from that story here at the very end in Genesis chapter five, uh, 45, verse 1. It says this, Joseph could no longer keep his composure in front of all his attendants, so he called out and said, send everyone away from me. No one was with him when he revealed his identity to his brothers. But he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it. And also Pharaoh's household heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But they could not answer him because they were terrified in his presence. If you heard someone crying like that, you'd be terrified too. Have you guys ever heard someone cry like that? Have you ever cried like that? So loud? And Joseph said to his brothers, please come near me. And they came near. I am Joseph, your brother, he said, the one you sold into Egypt. And now don't be grieved or angry with yourselves for selling me here because God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years and there will be five more years without plowing or harvesting. Verse seven, God sent me ahead of you to establish you as a remnant within the land and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. So here we see the preparation of God, the preparation of the sanding. We see Joseph experiencing the pain of sanding, but it's finally revealed the purpose of the sanding for a great deliverance. In verse 8, 
Therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. See, God is the one behind the sanding, not the thing that's doing the sanding. His dysfunctional relationship with his brothers ran so deep, so deep that, that Joseph almost needed a lifelong, uh, a couple of decades of sanding in other areas so that he can address the deep thing that was consistent throughout his life. And it was his relationship with his family. See, sometimes you can't just go straight to the deep stuff. You got to allow sanding in your life to take place, to remove layer after layer. We want to go straight to the, I want to deal with it all. If you dealt with it all, you literally might collapse and you won't be able to handle it. But if you allow God to remove layer after layer after layer through person, through people, through, through process, through circumstances, you'll eventually get to the heart of something that God is touching on deep in your soul. And I love this. God didn't just deliver them from famine. He delivered them for family. See, it would have been an easy thing. Later on, if you read the Bible, when, when Moses comes into the scene later on, they didn't have food when they were in the wilderness, but God provided manna from heaven. So God could have easily provided Jacob and, and, and Jacob's sons and Joseph's brothers. He could have provided them food. That would have been an easy thing to do. But I think God wanted to not just provide food, but provide a legacy and to restore this family to restore these relationships. The longer you walk with God, the more things are going to be revealed, layer after layer. And what's the point? What's the point in going deep with God if you don't allow God to go deep with you? So many times we, we go to church and we do things, we, we do religious and church Christian things, but we don't allow our family, our friends, people speaking into our lives, we don't give them access to really begin to sand down those imperfections and reveal those holes. So instead of sticking newspaper into the holes, like my father-in-law said, can you get to the point where those holes are revealed and someone can help insert the word of God? They can insert God's truth into you to sustain you and to help you. We all want God to shape us, but very few want the methods God uses to shape us. But the truth of the matter is this is why we, the church, that we have and we will continue to thrive in climates like we're in right now. Pandemics, financial crisis, you name, it doesn't matter. The church thrives. Why? Because God uses all these things to work out for our good because he, we are his workmanship and he is working something good in us. Good or bad, he works it together for our good to refine us and to shape us. You know, maybe being in the shutdown, working from home, constantly being around family, you might have used that phrase, it's rubbing me the wrong way. I would ask right now that God, that you would use these moments to rub them the right way and let them see that even if it hurts, even if it's uncomfortable, you're producing something good. Maybe being alone is the sanding. The fact that there's no one there, being alone is the very thing that's, that's interrupting you, making you uncomfortable. You're finding it hard. But don't let this opportunity be wasted. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, it says this, and I want to leave you with this. It says, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Let God finish the good work that he started in you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. God, we thank you that you would think of us in this way. Jesus, thank you for continuing to shape us and giving us this illustration of sandpaper, God, the preparation, the pain, the purpose. And God, I pray that whoever is feeling that suffering, whoever is feeling uh, that sandpaper in their lives in any capacity right now, God, may they be encouraged by your word that you have not abandoned them, and that this is a part of the process that you can and you will use to shape us into something, uh, something new, something that looks more like you. So, Father, we thank you for that. And, God, I want to pray for those uh, who, who are hearing this message and they're saying, you know what, I'm in a pit as well. And if that's you right now, you're saying, you know what, when, as you said that Joseph was in a pit with relational dysfunction with his family, some of you might have been able to identify with that. And we want to pray with you. 
But the truth of the matter is, is that those who don't have a relationship with Jesus are already in a pit as well. And if you're hearing this and you're saying, man, I want to have a relationship with God. I don't want to just go to church. I don't want to just call myself a Christian and check that box on the census. I, I genuinely want to have a relationship with God. God wants to restore you back to him. God wants to do that right now. So if that's you and you want to pray and give your life to Jesus, just pray with me. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I confess with my mouth that you are Lord of my life. You are in full control. And I believe in my heart that you were raised from the dead. And as a result, I receive your lordship and your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, or if you're considering praying that prayer, please make sure you email us at info at gracecovdc.org. Fill out an online connection card on our website. Make a comment below. Let, let someone from our team get in contact with you so this is not something that you do by yourself. And if you're still considering it, but you still want to talk to somebody, reach out to us. We would love to talk with you, pray with you, and stand together as we all go through this season. Not just of the pandemic, but in the different seasons of God sanding our lives. Bless you. Have a great week. Love you. Lord, Lord.